this is my version of that. I think I feel a lot of confusion and anger around arts criticism. Um, so I, I, I said about the lyricist panel, I don't care if anyone comes because I just want to hear the conversation. I'm so excited you're all here. I'm so excited to hear this conversation. And I have to say, it was the fastest panel to organize. Liz Engelman and I had a phone conversation. We chose the two people we wanted. I wrote them and I emailed her five minutes later and said, they have already both said yes and they like each other. <laughs> Come on. I am thrilled to give you Anne Catania from Lincoln Center Theater. Hi, everybody. Now I have to hold this microphone up, which is very heavy. I feel like, it, as Linda said, we're at the Golden Globe Awards here, <laughs> sitting at these little tables. Um, you know, I actually have three questions that I want to pose um, that, well, one of them sort of has something to do with, with drama criticism, but I actually don't really think of you guys as drama critics. I just think of you as fellow thinkers who were solving problems in the theater. So one will have something to do with it, but the other two won't. And I hope it might be a kind of free-ranging discussion about a bunch of things. And now I have to introduce this with the sun directly in my eyes. Okay. Um, so here, here are the three things I thought would be interesting to have a conversation with you guys about. Um, the first is that uh, when I went to graduate school in the Middle Ages, um, I was in a, a DFA program for dramatic literature and criticism uh, in the 70s. And I think uh, I, was, I was saying this uh, an email to my, my Linda and, and to uh, Peter, that I think at that moment there probably were 200 drama critics writing at various papers around the country. And there was one person who might have been known as a dramaturg, and that was Arthur Ballot in, in uh, Minnesota. Mm. And switching that ratio out, sitting, sitting around today, here are two drama critics at 200 dramaturgs, <laughs> uh, which would have just been uh, unimaginable then. I mean, it, it was just absolutely unimaginable. So that led me to um, what I think is what, it, that led me to my focus for this afternoon, which really has to do with change. I'm up here looking a little ragged because I'm in the la second to last day of the director's lab, which has been going from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. with a million elevator and bathroom problems for three solid weeks. And I have um, 58 directors, 24 actors, eight designers, and a stage management team from every country from Burundi to Brazil, all over the United States. So it's just been this ongoing questioning and talking about everything. Um, and the, the, second, um, the second topic, and I'm, then I'm going to go back and ask some questions about this, is we devoted the lab this year, as it, as it always is devoted, to something that comes out of a conversation in the listserv. We have like 1,500 directors talking to each other all over the world once they've finished the lab. And it, it had to do with the fact that there was a great deal of dissatisfaction with 90-minute realistic plays with six blackouts set in a family situation, three characters, you know, talking about something, a piece of information comes in, the phone rings, somebody enters, oh, you're pregnant, you know, blackout, <laughs> lose energy, lights up, next, you know, and you do a bunch of those and that's the play. So I decided to do a lab about extremely challenging plays that we love. Uh, and the love is more stress than the challenge, but equally so. Um, and and that has, that's what we've been doing for three weeks, and it's really been an eye-opener how rarely these directors, who are professional directors, um, you know, five or six years into their careers from all around the country, et cetera, how rarely they've had a chance to work on plays like this. Um, and how uh, just observing and then talk, you know, we have a fantastic group of actors, very, you know, great New York actors. It's been interesting to see how, how wary of any kind of conflict 
the directors are. Uh, and it's been interesting to see how, how, they, how they move quickly to game playing as opposed to diving in and, you know, and diving in and really figuring out some way to explore whatever these very different texts are. The texts range from When We Dead Awaken to Tamburlaine to The Owl Answers by Adrian Kennedy to the new Stoppard play to um, a, a fantastic Syrian play called The Drunken Days by uh, um, Wanusa Salad, I play I, I had just gotten to know, and a play for, a very good play from Costa Rica called La Segue, um, and the original version um, from the 19th century of Uncle Tom's Cabin. So obviously pretty radically different uh, challenges in each of those plays. Um, and that much of the dialogue with the company uh, and among themselves in the rehearsal rooms was very constrained to things that were, were positions that people knew they could go to that would not, that would, that were, I don't want to say politically correct, but that would avoid conflict. And it, it created a kind of storm where the actors were abandoned. They couldn't work in the way that they had hoped to work. And, um, you know, much has been worked through, but I think this, this question of the kind of plays that, that we are producing, the kind of plays that are coming out of the um, play development world in America and the directors who are capable of doing them is one that I want to touch on. Uh, that's my second point. Um, and then the other, the other thing, um, and I don't know whether it's just what's going on in the world today, you know, I mean, if you read the, if you go on the New York Times site, you'll see lots of stuff has been happening today, lots of stuff has been happening in the last week, lots of stuff has been happening, that there's, there's so much change going on right now, which is always a good thing. And um, I have been, uh, you know, thinking and talking, and especially with these, with these young directors, um, at, at great length about the whole, um, really the status of our resident theaters, the buildings, the buildings that have to be maintained, who the audience is for these buildings, who, who is being programmed for, um, and with the withdrawal of, of uh, support from, the, from obviously the government, corporations, the, the increasing reliance on boards who, t who are rich. So we have that elitist thing that surrounds us, which comes out of certain reasons. Um, and then I've had some very interesting conversations recently with, with I'm, I'm very in, in the Let Directors Lab to having people come in who are founding theaters in small cities around the United States where there are no theaters, because that's a really tough job to make a theater where, where there hasn't been one and how you reach out to the theater. But it's interesting how few of these directors think at all, um, I want to say politically, in terms of their communities. I mean, I, I've been asking, do you invite your, your local representative or your senator? Do you even know who they are? I mean, who comes to your opening nights? And the theater, the theater seemed to be very removed from the, from the uh, it's not just political life, but from the, from the life of the city that they're in. Um, which is which is news for many of us old timers who were in Washington for the lobbying for the NEA and who tried very hard to, you know, continue to involve people who represent us in the theater. So I, I'm sort of seeing the the institutions drifting away, and I don't know if the small theaters that are created are mainstreaming in in some way that ties them to a community. Um, and there's much discussion about. I'm doing a play and all my friends with MFAs are in the audience and then I go to all their plays, but where, where's my aunt? You know, where are the real people, my uncle? Um, and, and so that's on my mind. So to go back to the first, and then you're gonna throw out some things and then we'll open to questions at the end. I'm, I'm curious about, I mean, why, why has this dramaturg critics ratio ha swapped? You mean in this room? No, well, it's, it's swapped in this room, in this country. <laughs> this, this is a representative room. Two of us and the rest of them. You do think or I you do? Th I do think that's representative, yeah. Uh, do you have something else to add to that? Yes, go ahead, Linda. Just, darling, you do it first. 
Well, I don't know, you know, if you, you know, I'm, I write a lot about uh, theater in Washington, obviously, and I don't know that every uh, theater in Washington has a dramaturg. I think there are probably four or five companies that have, I mean, I can think of Woolly Mammoth and Studio Theater uh, and uh, Shakespeare Theater and Arena Stage. You know, a couple of years ago, actually, I made the decision in the, you know, in the little um, agate at the bottom of the reviews that we write, uh, which includes the lighting designer and the, and, and, the, and, the, and the set designer, I decided to, in certain circumstances to start adding the name of the dramaturg. Thank you very much. You're definitely going to get a hand um, on that one. Especially in situations where I felt, my God, this person had a challenge. Uh, I guess you don't write 400 word reviews. No, I don't write, no, I have a little more leeway than, than that. And um, I became more and more aware of the value of dramaturgy just from having done this over a period of years and, and started to understand a little bit about what literary managers do and, and what people who are assigned to this particular role in various facets have to do. But what's happening in terms of this ratio, what's happening is uh, uh, daily criticism as, a, as an ongoing thing is dying. It's just dying, and I don't know really what's replacing it at this point. Uh, papers like mine and Linda's are still engaged actively in reviewing as many things as we possibly can, but I have to say that the appetite for it is not growing. Uh, and that's reflected in the realities of my business, which is how many people are reading uh, your your stuff now. In the old days, it was your, you went out with the, the you know the, the the million other copies. Nobody knew who the hell was looking at your particular story, and now they can measure it you know by the minute. I had a st uh, the other day, I wrote a story about uh, uh, Steve Martin bringing a musical to Washington, and uh, it was just a news story in that case. More and more of my writing is actually non-reviews. And he, on, I noticed that he had tweeted an, on his account to his six million followers uh, my story. Well, that was how people read it. I mean, that's how, that's the bulk of the people who read my story read it on Steve Martin's Twitter account. So, you know, if, if I could get nothing but people with six million followers to tweet my stories and participate in shows, you know, I'd, we'd have more of a future here. But the truth of the matter is we're not, we're not leading any charge in terms of readership. And I think that, in a way, you, know, you, you and I have the same problem. I'm, you know, we're, we're more and more driven by what our audience wants as opposed to what our tastes might be even. Uh, uh, I, it, it affects what I decide to cover, both in Washington and in New York. So some of it is just the marketplace, and I don't have a solution. Linda, any thoughts? Yeah. <clears throat> For us, I think it's, um, it's not really the marketplace so much as the internet uh, you know, has done wonderful things for everybody, but not for newspapers. And, um, and the number of critics, are, you know, our colleagues, uh, the herd has been culled over and over and over again. You know, I just, I, I, I look down, I look up and I see how many more of the herd is gone and, you know, I go back down to grazing hoping that nobody will notice me. But it's um, just the space for critical writing, for professional arts coverage has diminished just about everywhere. Uh, you know, possibly not at the Washington Post, not at the Times, not at the Wall Street Journal, um, not at the LA Times, but for most of you who are working in city, other cities, you know what's going on with newspapers all around the country. So the, arts, uh, the art space has shrunk a lot and the, the, uh, the desire for commentary has shrunk even more so that, so that feature stories and news stories and trend stories um, are, are much more in demand 
than serious criticism. So um, I believe that, except for a small number of newspapers, that we are the last generation of on-staff critics. That from now on, there will be a couple papers that will always have on-staff critics, but otherwise, there's really, you know, I don't want my editors to know this, but there's really no reason to keep me on um, when, you know, we know I'm better than a lot of people, but am I better enough so that they, if they give $100 and a pair of tickets to somebody who writes for free on the internet, um, will enough people know that, that, will enough people miss Linda? So I, you know, I, they're going to have to pry my cold fingers from the ledge. I'm going to do this. But, um, but looking ahead, I do not see the um, critical writing, especially in newspapers, or especially then in places where people get paid, which is a kind of crappy way to look at what is a profession. But I think that, um, that professionals get paid for what they do and can do it as a lifetime, a lifetime occupation so that it isn't something that they do on the side and their real job is somewhere else. And that, you know, when I was a baby critic, there were hundreds of us. There was a, you know, we were wanted. And, um, and well, so I this is depressing, I, but that's all. I think all of us, you know, who, who have done any kind of beginning research on plays, when you go into archives and you, and you find coverage of plays from the 40s or 30s, you know, you find it often on the front page of, of a newspaper. You know, so-and-so stars in or an announcement of things, and then you see over the years, the decades, the coverage moving back and back into the paper and getting smaller and smaller and then gradually evaporating. And, and the question is, you know, what's going to replace it? And, and it's not even so much the who, you know, in terms of people writing on the internet or whatever, but, but I think it's, it's the discussion of theater in the, in the culture of this country. Where is that going to happen and is it going to happen? Well, uh, there, I, think that the, I think that the business or the, the I, I think is very conflicted about that question itself and, and sends very contradictory signals to Which us, business? their business, oh. the business of theater, uh, sends us very contradictory information. On the one hand, uh, there's, uh, there's an attempt sometimes to, uh, there's a sense, I think, a, a growing desperation in a sense among regional theaters, especially the, the feeling that they are trying to chase their audience and not sure even how to respond to reviews, uh, whether thoughtful or not. It, I have found over the period that I've been reviewing, and it's, it's spanned about uh, 20 years on and off, I started at the New York Times, as the off-Broadway critic and went to the Washington Post in 2002, uh, I have, to become the chief critic, I have noticed over that time that regional theaters have become much more ticket-driven, much more sing single ticket sale driven, and they think much more like commercial producers. What can you do for me? What can your review do for me? Uh, even among very serious people in the business, and I mean artistic directors, and I don't talk as much to literary managers and dramaturgs, but I, but it, it permeates the organizations to the point where you, you, you feel as if there, there's mission drift on that end. I still do the same thing I did as I did 20 years ago, um, and I hope I do it better than I did it then. But I feel as if uh, there's less good understanding between the people who review and the people who receive the reviews about what what our, our relationship is supposed to be. At the same time, there are companies out there that are starting to think about hiring their own content providers. This is, this is the newest thing in, in, the bus in, in the business, I keep calling it that, in, among arts institutions, large and medium size. They're starting to think, well, we're just gonna talk to our audience ourselves. Uh, we don't, you know, we're gonna hire quasi-journalists or journalists to do the job of a critic. We don't really need that intermediary. So that again, you know, there is this sort of, you know, a, to some degree a practical decision, but mostly it's a marketing and commercially driven decision by companies that are essentially not for profit. 
So I think that things, that ch one of the changes that has come is that there's, um, uh, I don't want to say less respect for what we do, but uh, uh, it, it seems less clear to, uh, to theaters that we're um, a useful part of the process. Yeah, and I think I think it's I think it's true. I've I've, I've seen in my own in my own years that that the uh, you know w with the decline in the number of critics, uh, there's been a decline in the power of critics as well to you know open and close shows and those kinds of things, which I think people in the theater are always grateful for. Yeah, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. By the way. I mean, w word of mouth is what sh should happen. Um, I think on s on some cases, but I'm curious, you know. Will it be better if, if we're at a place after you retire, which won't be too soon, I hope, you know, without any critics? I mean, wh what's, what's that landscape going to be like? I think... I can't even believe I'm saying I that sentence, not. but I, I... I actually think there's always going to be critics. I think that people want to have that next step in the conversation, and, and sitting in a restaurant after the theater and talking about it is is in some ways what we do but i think that people will always want to know what other people think and fa seek out people they trust to get that judgment the problem i think is that both in terms of the internet where people have these discussions on in um in niche groups so that so that theater that there's a lot of interesting commentary uh, going on in on theater websites, but it, for me, that gives up the possibility of actually talking to a large number of people. It, uh, you know, I'm I'm a '60s perfectibility of mankind people person, and I always thought that if you you know that if you expose people to things that you love that are great about the arts, then maybe they'll think, that probably they'll think so too. And coming in at a time in the late 60s and 70s that really there was that attitude that we wanted to reach a larger number of people. Now I think that, that there's, that we're, that people have to know what they need to know in order to find the commentary as opposed to that mosaic where you pick up a paper and you don't really know that you'd be interested in the review, this review, but because, because something about the writing compelled you to want to re read it, that you ended up being interested in something that you didn't know. And, and people who just, we're ending up to be, even though there's so much more information in the world, we don't know what we don't know. You have to know where to go to find it. And that, I think, is the same problem with what you were saying about the nonprofit theaters creating conversations with their own people. The other problem, and they're try they're, there's a, the other big issue is, is just the cost. And I do think that readers, our audience, uh, our, our, which should be our primary audience, the, just the reader out there who wants to know more about theater, you know, is, is really trying to figure out how much they want to spend to see something and it's a different calculus for theater than almost any other performing of the performing arts, maybe opera or ballet, but certainly not movies and television. Uh, they, can, they can do that very cheaply, but they still need to know if you're gonna charge them, a, you know, there are theaters in Washington for, and I, God love them, they do really good work, but they're charging for a, a four character play. And I'm, I'm only saying this because it just happens to stick in my mind that it was a four character play. I don't count the number of actors in each show, but they were charging like 120 bucks a ticket. And, you know, I, it doesn't even occur to me, and, and we're encouraged not to really think about how much is being charged per ticket to a show and trying to make some, you know, some, some judgment about whether it's worth it. Uh, that's not what we do. But the fact of the matter is that the, high, the more you charge, probably the more we're going to, you know, that probably does guarantee us some longevity in this business just because people, and I get letters when people feel like they've been rooked. They, they come to me. If I like something, they, you know, they want a refund, essentially. And, you know, it's like I'm the front line suddenly, and I'm in, uh, you know, I'm going to say, hey, I just, you know, I didn't pay to see it. Um, but, uh, um, 
but the, the fact of the matter, and maybe it would be better if we did, you know, maybe it would be better if we did. But all I'm, all I'm saying is that this is, you know, th that, that as much as we talk here about the art and, and, and what goes into uh, the crafting of a play, the incredible work that goes into it, it, it becomes very much a transaction for people out there who want us to tell them whether this is going to be, you know, economically worth it for them. Well, the consumer guide purpose of criticism has always been there. It's always been the least interesting part of the job for me. I think somewhere in there, for people who need to know whether or not to spend 120 bucks, they sh might be able to get that information in what I write. But, but just this sort of kill for a ticket, yes, no, thumbs up, thumbs down, winners, losers mentality of, of that concept of criticism is the most boring part of it for me. I mean, the, the, other, the other thing, and then, uh, then we'll move on to my other, you know, insolvable questions, um, is, I mean, somebody once said, you don't, you don't expect a civilian to go into a, to a, an operating room and say to a brain surgeon, hey, put that suture there, you know, but, but people seem to be absolutely free to say, Oh, the second act's too long, or, you know, to take something. I mean, people who have no idea what goes into making a play. And, and what, what worries me sometimes is if I'll see, I mean, I, you see on a chat room or something, somebody say, gosh, I went to a show and the leading actor was out and the understudy happened to be in the theater at that time and went on. <laughs> you know, and, and you think, okay, this is somebody who's never spent a day in the theater in their life. So you, you like to think that somebody is at least looking at your work who understands something about what you're doing. Well, it's, it's the, yeah, that's the downside of the democratization of the news, you know, that, that it's, it's great that everybody has an opinion, but if everybody can vote, has a, can vote someone off the island, then why do you need an expert? And there's such a suspicion of expertise there's actually a hostility against people who, who may be perceived as being experts now because, there's, um, because it's somehow anti-populist. And, you know, that's depressing. Well, we ha you know, I, I think about, I sometimes look open uh, other parts of the paper, and if you read, for example, a story about a football game, if you didn't know anything about football, it would be, a foreign language, you could not possibly figure out what the hell happened. There is, there is, and there's not enough time or space to educate people. And the same thing sort of is true of theater. I think we use shorthands. I remember using the word, the words restoration comedy in a piece in the Washington Post, and my editor, who's no longer my editor, said, uh, that's really too technical a, a term. And I thought, and he said, can we call it a, um, an old comedy? And I, <laughs> something. <laughs> and I said, no, I said, rest, listen. I said, restoration comedy is accepted as understood by enough people. And the ones who don't know it, damn it, they can go to their computer and Google restoration comedy. I mean, there is something to be said for a standard of, of, of what people can know and not know. On the other hand, I taught for 10 years, or almost 10 years at GW, a class of review, of, on reviewing, and I would take the students every week to a show, and many of them were honor students who had never been to the theater before. They were biology majors, and they just wanted, they had, you know, they had heard that the theater was interesting. And um, the first class was always a class in what you could wear, what you can't, you know, there was an appropriate, not that you can't, like I said, you know, you can go in almost anything, you know, t-shirts, jeans, it's not, but I mean, they didn't know. They had no, f these were 18, 19 year olds, and I realized, you know, that by the end of the course, they were totally immersed in theater. They'd seen 10 plays and written about them, and it was a magical world opened up to them. But I realized also that, you know, there is this mentoring a and a very close connection that has to be forged these days between uh, people who know the theater and people who don't know the theater to, m to broaden the audience, to make it something for more people. And, you know, I wish we had that skill. I, mean, I wish we had that luxury somehow to make the communication that I'm trying to do in reviews 
reach out to the people who don't quite feel comfortable going or even understanding some of the, some of the um, you know, I realize, you know, how many times a year I have to write, explain what the book of a musical is. You know, I, I can't, that term, you know, even on the copy desk at the Washington Post sometimes throws copy editors. We're it not- It isn't a pretty word, though. It's not specific enough. It needs a better word. All I'm saying, you know, it, the, but- Libretto but doesn't work. But we, these were things we took for granted 25 years ago. I think we take them, le we have to take them less for granted now as, 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 as the experience becomes a, 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 not so much, I'm sure there are a lot of people going. I mean, the, the numbers on Broadway seem to indicate, you know, millions of people are going, but I think the people who are interested in it more than just as something to put in a scrapbook about the time we went to the theater, um, it, it, you know, that's, the, that's, that's where we're, we're, we're losing the connection. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to the subject of plays and the kinds of plays that, that, that we're, we're seeing. So mostly, these are questions for you about what you're seeing and what you're happy seeing and what you're not seeing. I, um, I went to see the revival of Heidi Chronicles. Wendy was a very close friend of mine. I worked my first day as a professional dramaturg. was the second day of rehearsals of Uncommon Women and Others. I commissioned Isn't It Romantic? She was a very close friend of mine. Um, and there's a line which I'm not gonna be able to quote exactly about uh, where, where Scoop says, I want, a, uh, you know, I want a girl, I want to marry a girl, but I don't want to marry a 10, I want to marry a seven, because a 10 would be too challenging. Um, and and I'm, I'm wondering about plays that try for a 10 and maybe get a seven, as opposed to plays that try for a three and get a three. Are those plays punished? Do we, do we see them any, any more as much as we should? We, we, we saw them, you know, with Angels in America, you know, in my own life, the plays that I have worked on that have been the hardest and the most ambitious have been the most successful, oddly enough. Close to Utopia, right? I mean, Close to Utopia. everybody would say, what is Lincoln Center thinking or drinking? To, to do that, and it was a smash, right? A smash. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, and, and, and it, you know, I think there was an article in the New York, Review, New York Review, Review of Books, Daniel Mendelson, saying, when you see someone walking across the plaza at Lincoln Center at 11 at night after 12 hours in the theater, turning their cell phone and saying, and you can't believe what happened to Alexander Hertzen. It's like, whoa, you know? <laughs> Hard to believe. But any, any thoughts about that? About that? Yeah, I'm sure you have thoughts. I, I get more pleasure out of trying to force people to see tough stuff than any, almost anything else. Maybe finding new voices, somebody new, just you know, writing about somebody that has got no, gotten no attention who deserves it, that probably slightly more. But I, I, I'm a bit of a sadist, I guess. I like the idea of people thinking they should go see something that is going to be a little bit harder than they thought. Um, Mr. Burns started at Woolly Mammoth Theater a few years ago, and I was, I think it may have been one of the two or three best things I've seen in Washington in my 12 years in this job. And uh, I got as many what were you thinking responses as I did. People said, this is for me. Um, it, it, was, it, it was a play, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it, it just, it dazzled me with its, its ambition, its refusal to explain itself, its attempt to describe where we are as a culture, all those things that you want plays to do, uh, and, and did it in a kind, you know, in somewhat of an esoteric way for some people, but it was, it made people furious. I mean, they got angry at the idea that they couldn't grasp every minute of it. You know, we bec and that's sort of where, where we're at, you know, I think also of the flick, um, which thankfully won the Pulitzer Prize. But um, the artistic director of Playwrights Horizons, a very smart man who I think spoke, gave the keynote here yesterday, wrote an apology as, of a sorts to his audience because so I, many people... I think he regrets that now. And I, he definitely regrets it. And I've, yes, I know, it's a sore point with Tim. But, but um, you know, there was anger 
the audience. It wasn't just, you know, well, I didn't really get it, but it wasn't my cup of tea. I mean fury. And I think there's a kind of, you know, a level of, even among people who love the theater, there's a, a growing maybe intolerance of some of the, um, of the uh, idiosyncrasies that uh, playwrights choose to make the, the subject of their work. Although, or their although, the, although the flick just moved to a pretty good sized theater. I don't know how it's doing. You, yeah, it's a, it's it's a commercial well. run at the Barrow, but it's at the Barrow Brew. I mean, it's at the, yeah, the Barrow. I mean, it's well, a small little theater. Yeah. I mean, it's a small little off-Broadway theater. But I think it's doing well. Something that I noticed this year, and it's probably been true before, but it really bothered me this year, is that all of the, pl almost all the plays that got to Broadway that are at all um, challenging to the structure uh, in, in, in any way uh, not a traditional um, subject predicate, you know, family in the living room play, or British. And I couldn't, I mean, you know, you get, you don't want to like Brit bash because they're, they're doing good work, you know, they're good. But would the, the, um, the incident of the, of the dog in the nighttime, ha if it had opened at a nonprofit theater in America, would that have gotten to Broadway? Or, or would or, the or audience have gotten to Broadway, even not a great play, but still a historical drama that has, that, that people have to know a little bit about the theater, about or, history. Or, or why didn't an, Amer an American write Enron why didn't an American write it on? <coughs> but, um, but I it, wish an American had written it. It, it killed me this whole year to see that that if you're going to that all the all virtually all the American plays that got to Broadway were um, were either throwback middle brow comedies or um, or you know dysfunctional family plays. And, and when I, I could, you know, that, I mean, the river, the river would never, I mean, yes, it, the river got to Broadway because it had Hugh Jackman in it, but it was a play that nobody understood, right? Mm -hmm. It was on Broadway, people went, Hugh Jackman was in it, but, what, but it wasn't an American playwright. Would an American playwright, ev you know, have gotten a play like that onto Broadway? No, and so the American playwrights who are doing, you know, you, it's not that American playwrights are not doing challenging work, but it's not being seen. It's being kept in nonprofit ghettos, and I don't understand why it is that you know, that, it's, it's accept, uh, that, that people welcome a, a, a challenging, structurally challenging adventures plays, the, the, the beekeeper play with, um, with Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh, uh, Constellation. Constellations. Constellations. Who would have ever done that? Why is that an American play? Mm. You know, it was, but the experimental, not even experimental, but anything that pushes the form in American plays somehow don't get the larger audience. Except for, I have to say, I was having breakfast this morning with, with Louis Dothit. Is she here somewhere in this, at the Golden Globes? Okay, and I, I was, I, I can't say I was rehearsing this whole panel, but I was, I mentioned this to her and she said, you're forgetting something really important, so thank you, Louie, and that is, that's totally right, but, but, but and she said to me, I'm forgetting, and I, I was forgetting, that's not the case with musicals. If you look at Hamilton and you look at Fun Home, if you, I mean, there, there are many, there's something being pushed forward in that form that is experimental, that is new, that, that is on Broadway, that we're not seeing, perhaps, in the play world. Why, not, well, why aren't we seeing it in the play world? Are they not being written? Are the nonprofit theaters around the country not producing them because what you were talking about before, about them being afraid of their boards and afraid to alienate their, their audiences? All of those, virtually all of those plays that I mentioned that came from England, uh, I think with the exception of the audience, what were, came from nonprofit, yeah. what are the yeah. equivalent of nonprofit yeah. theaters. Came from yeah, and maybe we should stop theaters. talking about Broadway. But they're, yeah, but they're also, I mean, Hand to God made it to Broadway, which is, you know. Silly. Uh, 
it's silly, but it's not, I mean, it's a serious play. <laughs> it's also a serious play, I think. And um, remember last season, the, the, the Willino play? The Realistic Joneses? I mean, they are, there are attempts by some producers. Dis thank you. Clybourne Park, you go. can't go to Winter Park. Right, and, um, uh, you know, and Clybourne Park. And, I mean, they're not, you know, they're not blockbusters, any, you know, particularly, but it's happening. I'm not so sure it's, it, it breaks down quite that. Well, it did um, this year. It did this year, except for Disgraced. And, and when you, you were talking about what about if it's a te it tries to be a 10 and it's a 7, uh, shall we give that more credit than if it just tries to be a 5 and it's a 5? Mm -hmm. uh, I found that with Disgraced, which I think is a superior play to anything that opened, you know, just looking at Broadway this year, but it was not a particularly good production. And then you have something like Curious Incident, which is a lesser play, but a spectacular production. And then how do you decide? Mm -hmm. you know, can, and do you tell people, oh, please go to see Disgraced. It's a really good play, even though it was better when it was at Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. Is your question, Ann, do, should we be giving them the benefit of the doubt? Is that what you're asking? Well, I mean, I'm like just- Like plays that are difficult plays? I mean, I, I was thinking about, about you know, after after the Angels in America, Tony Kushner was writing this play on commission for the National Theater called Henry Box Brown, which he never finished. And and you know, probably like the Intelligent and Homosexuals Guide to the Universe, it it wasn't as you know, what's the word, perfect or good a play as Angels in America, but it was might have been really interesting. And somehow those kinds of plays, you know, I mean, Bruce wrote. Uh, the Low Road in London, which was an, you know, somebody helped me describe it, a sort of epic English history play about Adam Smith, you know, and, and, and it's, it, it, it's hopefully being done here, but it's not 100% certain. And it, it's big, it's messy, I don't think it's a perfect play, but, and I hope he's not ever gonna listen to this, but I think it's really, uh, you know, incredibly interesting, and somehow that, that kind of, raw ruggedness of ambition and I'm, and again it's not really broadway it's more it's more than not broadway what theater you, wh what are you pr proposing here that i mean that we're not championing those plays i'm just trying to understand what you're where do we bring this to a the well, point I, of the I, intersection I, of the critics i mean i i'm thinking more of why aren't we the dramaturgs championing championing those plays oh, because okay, because we're the ones who are who are getting them getting them out there i mean sometimes it seems to me that plays that are that are, how do I put this, uh, you know, weird for weird's sake, have what I, I call the waiting for Godot retrospective effect. You know, you don't want to be the person who saw Waiting for Godot and wrote that bad review about it. So you're willing to take a, a, a lot more, uh, give a lot more leeway to things um, that you just simply don't understand at all. But somehow that there's that middle ground of writers who you respect and like, who are trying something different, that get cut down. I don't think theaters, from my point of view, I don't think theaters care much what I, what I say should be, you know, what writers I like and what writers should be done more. I, I've, over the years, written many times, not, I don't say, here's what you should do, but, uh, you know, but people I have admired, and there are many uh, American writers that fall into that American playwrights that fall into that category, I never feel like I get any, uh, that the artistic directors of theaters that I cover have any interest in, not particular interest in, um, um, in what I've said, except if it's a production I've seen of the work that uh, they're thinking of doing in Washington because, oh, it'll get a good review when it's here. That'll help. Um, I don't, that's why I'm saying, I don't think there's a real conversation that goes on. Uh, even among people who are, you know, I, I don't think you can, whatever you can accuse us of in terms of our defaults, you can't accuse us of not loving this work, the profession, the, the thing we cover. You can't do that, and, um, and, I, and maybe the grievances become bigger than the, the appreciation, whatever level that you feel, you know, we're, we are doing some good. But I never feel like that evolves beyond my sort of having a conversation that I start with um, the theaters coming back and continuing the conversation, either because they're afraid of, uh, you know, there are all these, the, there are all these myths, like you're gonna offend the, per the critic. Don't, listen, don't talk to him. 
He's gonna, you know, you're gonna say something about his shirt, and he loves this shirt, and you hate the shirt, and now he's gonna, the next two plays are gonna get lousy reviews because you told him you didn't like his shirt. I mean, I'm just saying, it's that, it's become that. And, and if, in fact, we're in a world where there's less of us, but still have some credibility and authority to some degree, you know, there is no reason that we shouldn't be talking uh, uh, more about the things, not necessarily because you're currying favor or you want a good review next time, but because, you know, we're in, we're in a world of uh, uncertain sounding boards. You know, we are a constant for the time we're in these jobs. And I don't think that gets through. And it's probably partially our fault because we're so distracted by whatever's coming next. But on the other hand, you know, when you, because when you threw that out to the dramaturgs, I'm thinking, well, why are you not asking us <laughs> about the seven to ten? You know what I mean? I think there's a, and if anyone has a shared sense of the world, you know, in terms of the word, maybe you, you guys, you know, understand uh, things about plays that we will never understand, but I don't, but, you know, we share that, that well, love of the language and the love of what, what happens when a playwright um, attempts I, to make I, these I think, happen. you know, a, a lot of it, uh, too, has to do with what, what Linda, what the, you were saying about you have 400 words or whatever. I mean, if you look at the criticism of O'Neill or something like that, I mean, you know, y you can see people writing about O'Neill, tracking play after play, and, you know, this is what he seems to be trying to do in this play, and this is, you know, and it's part of a, a larger discussion than just an up or down. It was a, there was a sense of it being part of the literature. Um, for 23 years, I've been teaching critical writing to dramaturgs right next door at Dodge um, in the School of the Arts here at Columbia. <clears throat> so I feel like I have a foot in the dramaturg, dramaturgs and, and the critics. I got a little students here. Um, and, and part of what they do for, for their final papers, they uh, each, one, each one writes a, uh, reads an, uh, an, anth uh, an anthology, a collection by some historical critic. And just looking at what kind of writing was going on there and compare it to what we're, what we're allowed to do, what we're encouraged to do, what there's an appetite to do now, it's, um, it's a different world. Uh, I'm, I have these collections called the theatrical th theater reviews, New York theater reviews, that um, used to come out monthly, and, port and I was at the Chicago Tribune for 11 years, and the woman before me was Claudia Cassidy, and she used to collect them. Mm -hmm. So when, sh when um, no one wanted them, I took them home. And I have collections of all the reviews from different years in New York. So I could pick up, um, and we do this in class, I'll bring in the 1956 volume, mm -hmm. and we'll look at, look at you know, the 12 critics who reviewed that play and look at the amount of space they had, and look at, and imagine that they all wrote on deadline. They all came back from the theater mm -hmm. and wrote those beautiful things um, at, a, a, you know, before they went to sleep that night. And, and it had a place in people's lives and in the theater's lives that I think, um, I think for reasons that are, larger than newspapers and larger than the theater and larger than critics um, has changed. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just the kind of country we live in now. Yeah. And, and it, it's not there. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to my last question because I want to leave some time for people to ask questions. Um, I mean, Linda, you're a New Yorker. You're, you're from Washington, which is a little further away, although it's still sort of <laughs> on the East Coast. But opening our vision to what's happening in other cities around the country, you know, and other, other theaters who are communicating, whether it's the Alliance Theater or whether it's Seattle Rep or whether it's the Taper or the Goodman or, you know, I, I'm just curious about your thoughts about, about where these institutions will be in, in 20 years. And, and is, are the, is the kind of theater that young people are making, which I'm hoping you'll jump in on this later with questions, going to end up into the into that environment and that's into that space which is really a creation of the 1960s um, that's when those theaters were built there was a vision for them of a particular sort which and and they've can and they've grown I mean I have some piece of 
napkin that I wrote, and some amazing, I should have brought it, some statistic that I read, probably from Pew, that, you know, there's, there's something like 1,800 theaters in America now that have operating budgets of over, of over uh, $225,000 a year, which is absolutely incredible, considering there is that statistic when they founded the NEA uh, that only 5% of the American population had ever been in a theater. You know, we're not a nation of aristocrats, we're a nation of peasants, so n nobody had that tradition. I mean, there had been theater, but so it's pretty remarkable what's happened. But at the same time, you, you wonder, just the idea of, and then at the other hand, you know, obviously you have the whole thing about, you know, where do people want to live? They want to live where there's some kind of culture, whether, you know, you can't get young people who are smart to move to a city where there isn't a university, where there isn't some hip tech thing, where there isn't some kind of art scene. People are leaving towns where there aren't. So, so th there's some role for, 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 for those institutions, but I don't know. What, what do you think about where, the, where they'll be? Whether we're talking about, you know, Cleveland Playhouse, TCG was just out there, and San Francisco. It's hard for me because I'm so New York based now, but I was the theater critic at the Chicago Tribune in the 70s and, um, and watched the birth of the, sh the, the off-loop theater movement, the Chicago theater movement. And that happened at a time when really theater in Chicago was touring companies and dinner theaters and Second City. And, and suddenly people who, who, who moved there moved there or just got out of college and started wanting to do theater and these little theaters that are now major institutions began because because smart interesting young people wanted to put on a show and and it was years and years of that accumulation before there was this recognition that Chicago's a major theater center but um, I want to believe that the people who, the Stuart Gordons and the, you know, the, the, the people who began those little theaters in the 70s in Chicago because they needed to have that kind of fun um, are still doing it somewhere. Uh, but I'm, I'm incapable of knowing where the institutional theaters are going to be going. I, um, you know, in Washington, you have a better idea. I think the bigger the theater, the bigger the problem they've got at this point. The Shakespeare Theater Company, uh, every major theater in Washington over the last 12 years has built a new theater, every one. It's a completely new infrastructure from, from um, um, every one. And there's a lot of theater companies in Washington. A lot of, it's a big constellation of, of big companies, of, 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 or even mid-sized companies. The Shakespeare Theater Company last year uh, did a production of a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, which to my mind uh, forms no part of the classical canon. This year they did Man of La Mancha. Uh, this is not what they did five and 10 years ago. And when I asked, they said, well, it's based on Plautus, a funny thing. Uh, you know, I, well, there you go. I mean, you know, hello, Dolly. You know, uh, uh, you know, is is based on the matchmaker. So I guess you know everything you know is can, is fair game. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a game of filling seats, and you can't, you know, the missions are changing, desperately trying to find people who are going to fill these seats. It's not unlike what's happened on Broadway, where you can't fill 12, 1,500 seats every night. Uh, it's a little larger scale with if you don't know who the, the main actor is. It's just, you know, this was never the issue. You know, it, once upon a time, the playwrights and the songwriters were, were the stars on Broadway. That's no longer the case. You cannot, almost in any case, in very few, the Book of Mormon is an unusual example, in, even in, out, outside of Washington, uh, I mean, outside of New York. But um, all I'm, I, I think there is a huge problem with what is going to be filling these theaters uh, in the in the coming deck in the coming 20 years, it's um, the, the the most successful theaters in Washington, to my mind, are the ones that didn't build to the high, uh, highest level of seats. Woolly Mammoth has a 250 seat theater. Uh, the Studio Theater has four 200 seat theaters. That's about it, I think, in terms of if you want to sell out a play, 
that's what that's the scale you have to think of these days at least from what I'm you know I'm talking about plays musicals it's a little different um, but the Shakespeare Theatre Company can't fill their 800 seat theater every night with as you like it unless um, you know you get Halle Berry uh, and, uh, and and a Cardassian you know to do it I mean basically you can't do it any you know it's not going to um, it's not happening um, so um, uh, the, the, the prognosis, I think, for many of these places that built up, and the other thing is um, that a lot of theaters found that their donors would give them lots of money if you could put their name on something. They won't give as much money if it's for commissioning plays or sponsoring a, 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 a playwright, a season by a playwright. That doesn't have permanence for them for many people, there are a few. Arena Stage did a, a residential program for playwrights a few years ago, a playwright in residence program that was heralded with a big grant from the Mellon Foundation, and it has sort of withered uh, over the years. It didn't have any, uh, it, it, it didn't fulfill its promise. Uh, they even gave health coverage to the playwrights. It was extraordinary. It was a great advance. I don't even know if that program has is being renewed, and yet they've got these giant new spaces that have incredible heating bills that they've got to, that they're going to have to pay for. And what are they going to put in those theaters? They just did Fiddler on the Roof. I mean, that's what we're talking about. And on that note, I think we'll open to questions. <laughs> Peter, you, you said a startling thing, and you mentioned the occurrence of institutional in-house creation of descriptive or critical material about the theater's product. And that makes me think of Lessing, who was hired to do the same thing for his theater in the 18th century. Now, might there be a possibility there of something that isn't simply um, PR promotion, but actually a place of perhaps dramaturgical innovation in terms of communicating with a much more clarified local and specific audience? I think that's a, a, a useful and an evolving notion that is going to take hold in, in places where there is a literary bent and a, and a staff with the sophistication to, to carry out what you're, what you're saying. And I, I think there are places where that would be a perfectly great thing. I think it's already being done at Lincoln Center, not to suck up to Anne or anything. But, um, but Lincoln Center uh, um, Theater puts out a magazine that uh, dramaturgically and, and philosophically and sociologically ha it, about their major productions that, is, that offers insight and enjoyment um, that you don't get anywhere else. And I believe that when a theater has the resources, but also the smart enough people to want to do it. And this, this magazine's been going on for a pretty long time now. 67 issues. And each one of them, honestly, um, have been uh, more valuable than some plays I've seen. You know, <laughs> more, not necessarily your plays, but you know, I, I mean, I got more about, about the theater from, from reading these lovely magazines, these important magazines. So. Something else about hiring your own critic. Um, I just did a little column for next week about um, there's a website in LA called Bitter Lemons. Uh, I think their, 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 their logo is bringing Los Angeles theater together whether you want to or not. And they are, um, they've started this program of allowing theaters or actors or directors or anything to buy a, cr a review. For $150, a, critic, a, a theater can buy 
a, um, pay for a critic um, to come to their theater and write any, a 300 word or more review. Um, and the only guarantee is that, you know, it can't, it's not going to be a positive review necessarily. They're supposedly going to, the objective is that they be, um, that they be not compromised. And the reviews will run on the website for the first week or something, and after that, it can go in, be be uh, disseminated by the writers or by the theaters or whatever. You know, I have no idea if this if that can work. Hundred twenty-five dollars of it goes to the author, goes goes to the critic, and twenty-five goes back to the website to um, to to administer the program. You know, there's a lot of critics out of work in, in, in L.A., and a lot of theaters not getting reviewed. Is this a solution? I don't know. They were, the, 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 the people who were buying the review, and you were, you're not, you don't, the other part of it is you don't get to pick your critic. They assign somebody, just like a, a news organization would, um, and most of the uh, reviews were being purchased for a fringe, by a fringe festival, which makes sense in a way. I mean, it was almost, you know, any attention was going to be worth it for a play that's trying to stand out from a, you know, a panoply of plays. But I don't think it's going to, I don't think that, I think that uh, the, that's going to be a very hard model to replicate. Hey, mister, you want to buy a, a theater review? I just, I just think, it be, you know, we live in a, tra in, it, in a transparent world where we, you know, it's instantly known that this was paid for. It, 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 it devalues it immediately, even if it's smart. Um, I think that's going to be a, a tainted model. I just don't think that's going to ant that's going to solve anything. I think it's possible to have it not be tainted if it's administered correctly. Because as long as they are absolutely upfront about, you know, they've chosen the critics, the people, you know, I, you know, I go back to that stupid idealism thing that chases me around. But. Hi, I'm Kat Rodriguez. I'm in Baltimore right now. Um, I have, uh, I guess, a comment and then a, and then a question. As an early career dramaturg, um, I don't know. Maybe I'm not jaded yet, but I see I see my peers, whether they're uh, you know early career professionals in the theater or not, um, caring about representation and the dialogue around it. So I think there is hope. I'm actually hopeful. Uh, and then the second thing is, this is a question that is coming out kind of of some of the conversations we've had at other panels regarding um, theater for young audiences or, or uh, theater made by affinity groups. Uh, and it's a conversation that has also been had a lot in the Latino Theater Commons, and I know Talala Rivas is a kind of champion of this question, but what do you do, what is your advice for a theater company or an artist who creates work and it just doesn't get reviewed? For example, I did some freelance work in Tucson at Borderlands, and the local critic just decided, you know, your work's not good, so I'm going to stop reviewing it. And it's the theater company that is doing work for and by and telling the stories of the indigenous and the Latino Latina community. It's so important. Um, so what do you do for that, and then especially for artists who are working in academia or who need that you know, that criticism for their portfolios or for their tenure track positions. You know, what's, what's, what's starting up in some cities, I don't know, I can't talk for every city, but there are uh, websites, you know, theater intensive websites that just review locally. Uh, we, there are three in Washington. They don't pay their critics. Uh, for the most part, I think it's a voluntary kind of thing, but it's 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 grassroots. I can't I can't vouch for the quality of every review, but they cover the waterfront, and it's a matter of organization. You know, there's a new organization in Washington called the D.C. Coalition for Social Theater and Social Justice. They're trying to do it from the other end. They're trying to get communities organized uh, to do uh, theater that's pertinent to them. And this is just another manifestation of that. It, you know, there, there needs to be uh, like-minded people who are going to create some vehicle for it. It's not that, it doesn't seem, I mean, it probably takes a lot of, organ of, of work, a lot of sweat, but, but you know, you're not, you're going to have the hardest time with the large media organization and getting them to come just off 
the cuff unless it's some incredibly uh, 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 newsworthy or intensely interesting subject. I, you know, but also, but again, you know, a lot of organizations are looking for things that are going to bring in new audiences, and certainly, um, you know, any large, you know, uh, anything that's, that, that interests the Latino community is going to be, is going to eventually start to you know, get attention. It t might take some time. But, but the way, but the internet, you know, the websites, are, you take a look at something called DC Theater Scene. It'll give you an idea. And you're in Baltimore, so you'll, you're close enough. Uh, yeah. You're right, you're right around the corner. Hello, my name is Coriana Moffitt. Uh, my question will begin with a short explanation in that in the past two weeks in Boston, uh, four reviews have come out on three shows uh, and each of the four reviews has uh, had some uh, racist uh, comments, um, specifically talking about why characters in these shows were played by people of color and what the purpose or point of that was in that they did not themselves, that their characters were not there solely like, for, to represent their race. Um, and these are reviews from bloggers, from like the Metro version in Boston and from uh, just side newspapers. So I guess my question, I have a couple. I mean, you're welcome to answer however many you want. Uh, just uh, is there any kind of mentoring in the critic community of how to talk about race? Uh, also, how do you talk about race? And how do you advise for theater companies to address these issues when they come up? It's a landmine, um, just as it is in America. Uh, and since the theater The best theater deals with a lot of the things that we have to be as people. We bring what the people that we are. Uh, you know, you can be a critic who believes that you are um, a, a tolerant, open-minded, ready for anything person, and then be surprised. Uh, just, I don't know how you deal with a critic who you perceive as racist. There used to be one major critic in New York who, who would regularly um, make, uh, you know, slam Jews and black people and was extremely negative about uh, non-traditional casting. And, um, and for those people, you just have to wait until somebody smarter comes, you know, more open comes around. But, the thing is that it's so difficult because I remember there was a, an all-black production of some, some fluffy 30s musical. And I remember thinking, well, this is a, you know, it was a fluff ball in the 30s and now it's an all-black fluff ball. And I reviewed it, you know, as, as a, this black production of this fluff ball, but I didn't take it any more seriously than that. And then I got up the next morning and found out that the New York Times said it was a minstrel show. And I went, holy shit, was that a minstrel show? Did I not recognize that it was a minstrel show? And you know, you have to, you have to constantly be asking yourself these questions just as you do as a human being. Because um, you can't just do knee jerk reactions and, um, and the theater is gonna be pushing pushing buttons and pushing boundaries. I'm not sure I'm answering your question at all. I, n I don't understand why people do go to plays if they're not going to have their minds opened up to things they haven't heard or seen before. It always astonishes me when I read in reviews the kind of, the, in 2015, the kind of like, um, uh, suppositions people make about or have they, they, what they bring from their own uh, backgrounds or their limited backgrounds, um, th what they bring to the to the to the review. Uh, I think you're talking about the case. Is this the one where um, it was involving a, a Filipino American? Yeah, 
Uh, I read about that. Uh, you know, it's the, the reviewers are only as good as their as their as 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 their what they bring of of themselves and their own curiosity about the world. Uh, and if you come with that attitude, you're not, you're most, 99% of the time, not going to make those really ignorant remarks. There was a review in, in London just a couple of weeks ago of, of the motherfucker with the hat, which was, uh, you know, a st you know ma mouth dropping by a major publication, mouth droppingly dumb and, 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 and scary. And scary to think that you could, you could, say these things and you know I you know it's not about political correctness it's about human decency and it's also about your capacity to br to understand things you didn't understand when you walked in the door um that's the whole point of this and if you're if you're if you're about parading your ignorance if that's what you think this job is so that you can find like-minded ignorant people to 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 agree with you then you're really not going to um you're not going to gain much respect in the long run um, so, you know, I mean, my answer is, those people will wither. Those people won't have staying power because they don't have the, the fortitude to do this kind of work over the long term. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was a total pan. It was a total, I mean, it was, he used words that were, you know, of, offensive. We have a question from the Twitterverse, which is asking both of you to speak um, to how you think about the communication you're having with each of your constituencies. So you're writing presumably for ticket buyers, you're writing presumably in a dialogue with the artists in your city. Peter, I know that's true of you, particularly in Washington, D.C., because I know a lot of those artists and I know they know you and talk to you. Um, and, you know, perhaps theater management. Can you talk a little bit about that to address Twitter folk? Uh, twi I started uh, tweeting about four years ago, I think, three or four years ago, and it changed my whole perspective on this job. Uh, it, 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 a 180 degree change for me in terms of what I was learning, who I realized was listening, and who was trying to listen, what things I could gather personally and experientially about myself and the job that would help me understand where theater was going. All those things happened for me. Um, the, the, down, the other side of it was uh, I, I was conscious, though, of people I was writing about who were now in direct communication with me, and sometimes that, was, that made for painful exchanges, or at least more difficult ones, because the, the model is we're supposed to be behind, you know, I mean, for all time was, you know, don't have any, don't have any contact with the people you're writing about because um, it's going to color your your sense of you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you know s save your bullets so to speak, to put it in really gross terms. But um, um, I see myself foremost when I write. I try to write for a, an informed reader. I don't try to write for the industry for for people who work in the industry. I don't try to write for um, the the creators of the work. I try to write for people with whom I I'm imagining I'm talking behind their back in a sense in the review. And if they choose to, you know, eavesdrop, that's their decision. I'm talking about the writers and the actors and the directors. If they want to um, um, participate, that's their decision. But I try, I try to look at it as um, uh, people out there who I can either somehow persuade of the value of some aspect of this work. And um, uh, uh, I would say that that's become harder with Twitter, and that part of the job has become harder because I am conscious of. Uh, and and the only other difference I would say is that when it's a when it's a embryonic work, when it's a first production of something, either musical or play, that I know is going to go on from Washington to somewhere else, eventually probably New York. I that's the only exception. I do have consciously in mind what would be helpful from one audience member's perspective in terms of what might help in the next time they think about this piece, what some of the objections might be, either completely ludicrous or very, very um, helpful. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's because it's just my reaction. Hi. Um, 
I've been struggling with the whole question of elitism and, and classism and um, found myself perhaps guilty of it. And Peter, you were mentioning this first class of protocol in theater for college students. Um, I was at a production, I don't know, about a year ago. Uh, there was a student group there. I was very happy to see students there. They were young. They were, I think, in high school. And one woman was sitting next to me, and she was texting the whole time. And um, I said something to her. I thought she would stop. I thought, you know what? Lighten up. Don't say anything. I couldn't help myself. In the second act, I said something. And she said, what? You know, why? You know, um, my phone's not on. And I said, well, but you're sitting next to me. It's bothering me. And more importantly, it's probably bothering the actors, you know, who notice it. And I could tell this never occurred to her. Okay. I got into a conversation with her teacher afterwards. The teacher sort of took the responsibility. But I, I got into almost an, an altercation, which was not right. But um, I guess the question is, you know, with so much being affected by the fact that we don't, like in England, have a culture of going to the theater, the prices even in nonprofit are really unaffordable. You know, it's 60 70 80 $90 to go to Off-Broadway now, um, except for student groups. And I've worked on productions where the artist has said, we have got to have 10 or $20 tickets for this, insisted on it. I mean, what is the solution so that it becomes a more democratic cultural phenomenon? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there needs to be uh, cheaper tickets, um, for sure. Um, I think we shouldn't idealize the audiences in London because I, a couple years ago, I read all these stories about complaints about People were having sex in the balconies of plays and, and eating in the first row, passing chicken down the line. And, um, <laughs> and so I think that manners are, uh, are uh, bad manners are, are not just our problem because we have a, a not very good education system, alas, anymore. Um, but I think that, um, that People who have, uh, I do talk to, I don't talk to, to the artists. Back to the other qu question. I feel very, very strongly that I am not advising the artists how to, how to dance or how to play the piccolo or, or how better to enunciate. That's for their teachers to do and for the people in, in, in their professional lives to do. If they read something that I write, and it's helpful to them, that's great, but that's not my job. But my job, I believe, is to talk to, to um, sort of the, 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 the person who's not a specialist. You know, I always, because I've always worked for, for mass market organizations, and I've always wanted to talk to people like my mother, who was not a particularly well-educated woman, but a sensitive woman. And that I would like to tell my mother why she should like this play. And so I, th and I think that my rule is don't overestimate um, the reader's information or underestimate their intelligence. That, that if you can find that balance. And, and in that way, I think that maybe you do get to, to bring in more people who wouldn't ordinarily go to the theater. And I, I don't know if there's a way to tell people that you don't tweet, you don't, you don't um, text in the theater except, you know, the Gestapo tactics that they use it in, you know, yelling at people when they when when anything happens but it's um there's just there's just a lot of bad manners around and and um, possibly by example we can we can help but I don't I probably didn't answer that either I would just say um, uh, uh, briefly that I found that it, when I had students who really I mean they were motivated enough to take a course and find out more but really didn't know what to expect uh, from what they were going to see or whether this would even be for them and even probably didn't like all the things we saw but I did know that after 10 shows that the close mentoring that I did over a period of 16 weeks turned 
many of them into theater kids. They, they understood the language, they were proud to tell other people that what they'd seen and to kind of get them, you know, they wanted to like proselytize as a result. I wouldn't say everybody, but over the years I've stayed in touch with enough of them and they've become regular theater goers. It takes, it's, it's I think a, in this day and age, it takes that kind of close contact and it's not once it's not taking your fourth grade class and letting them see a great musical you know there'll be two percent will you know be enchanted and maybe tell their moms and dads they want to go i think it, it's persistent repeated uh, 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 engaged discussion and at the at the at whatever stage of life they're at and college students are a perfect one because they're they're looking for every you know they're looking for the next what, what comes next in their lives and yeah, they, it may not, it'll, that's how I think it's gonna have to happen. It has, it's like, we're gonna have to be like little guerrilla groups of, you know, <laughs> of, 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 of mentors. Hi, I'm Shelly. I teach at a university in San Diego, San Diego State University, and so I'm thinking a lot about these questions, both the questions about the advent of the internet, and I appreciate very much the um, devastating changes that that has wrought on your field. Um, but I'm wondering if we can think about the flip side, the positive side of it. Um, and also think about young people and thinking about, I'm always thinking as a person who works with uh, undergraduates and graduates, thinking about training critics and what that pathway is because oftentimes it feels like they either go through the journalism school and have no knowledge of theater or they go through the theater area and have little, very little understanding of the whole journalism side. So it's interesting, I think, to think um, if we can you know, honor those who have been let go and that kind of thing, but think about that next group that might be coming up and taking advantage of this new form. You know, maybe we don't have to be limited to 400 words if we're not going into print. Maybe we don't have to follow the same structure we've always followed so somebody can cut off the last couple paragraphs. We don't have to worry so much about that when we can be online. So maybe there's some positives. Also, I, think I see in my students, especially on things like ratemyprofessor.com, that they are reviewers from a very early age. <laughs> they put their thoughts out about everything, right? I mean, whether it's, you know, a video game or food or, you know, so there's a lot of criticism happening out there. So I'm just wondering how we can maybe see or imagine the next generation of critics, you know, whatever the format is that their criticism will funnel into. I don't know what that's going to look like necessarily, and I'm not sure I like the idea or what I think of the idea of theaters paying for their review. It's like theater subsidizing the journalism. I don't know. I'm not sure what I think about that, but um, I'm thinking. Um, but yeah, how do we train that next generation of criticism that's coming up, the next group of people? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, I, 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 you know, I don't know why, you know, it has to, you know, I mean, theater criticism hasn't been, hasn't been around for, you know, centuries. I mean, it's been around a couple of centuries, probably. Um, there's no reason it can't be reinvented in another way. Uh, we're probably not the right people to ask that, you know, <laughs> because we've been doing it for so long in the way we've done it, and we know a way to do it. Uh, you need someone to, you know, to look at what we've done and say, Let, we can improvise on this. There's no reason to ignore the past and what's been done, and if there is a new way to do it, it's going to be, you know, somebody in their 20s or 30s or maybe even teens now who's going to do that. I don't think you know, this, we're not the people who are going to decide that. But it's not as if people didn't do that with us. Um, hmm. there, there isn't, there's no one way that anybody, any of us became critics. But I was, I, I always um, uh, depress my students and say, I know, you know, it's really boring to hear that the 60s were better. But th I was part of a Rockefeller Foundation program for the training of classical music critics. Imagine the Rockefeller Foundation training classical music critics for two years in 68-69 uh, and then also was at a dance critic training program at, and then and now Peter and I both teach at the O'Neill Center um, in the summers where we where we uh, work with with young critics and um, and mid-career critics but that's not the same thing as what you're saying which is somebody you know, the Rockefeller Foundation Program for the Training of Internet Critics. And, um, and, and that, as Peter said, is for someone else. Okay, hi, my name is Janine Sobeck, formerly of Arena Stage in DC, currently at Brigham Young University. Um, we've talked a lot uh, 
the conference about this idea of community. And I'm, as I've been listening to the conversation, I'm wondering about the question of, is it possible for theater artists and critics to work together in a way that doesn't compromise the integrity of your review, but that allows theaters to work with their local critics in a way that allows them to fill an 800 seat house regularly without a show that is forum in any way related to Broadway or have a huge star attached. How do theater artists and critics work together and is it possible? Um, I have no friends. Uh, <laughs> in, in the field, um, intentionally because I found early on in Chicago when I was reviewing people who were, lived in my neighborhood that when I could see their little faces above the keyboard, I was in trouble. That whenever, that I would either think, well, am I being especially mean to this guy because I have to prove to myself that I'm not favoring him because I like him and then there's just layers and layers and layers. Many critics can, ha can be involved in the theater, the workings of the theater, and not have a problem with it. I can't do it. I have what I refer to as emotional conflicts of interest, and which I think are much more uh, toxic than whether or not somebody buys you a, a theater ticket. Um, that, and, and it may, may have something to do with being a woman. There aren't many women theater critics still, but there are some. But it may be just, being raised to please, you know, the way I was, that, that possibly I make an emotional connection with the people that, I'm, that, I, that I need to review. And it's, there are enough complications between me and the event and the review without complicating it further with having emotional feelings about the people I'm writing about. So I have basically a drawbridge O over the moat. Um, many, many critics can function otherwise, but I can't do it. Well, there's, and by the way, there's other ways to reach audiences than reviews, as you know. And there's, a, there's a gallery of possibilities, and uh, the, the, the ways in which uh, theater writers can activate those uh, are really, you know, it's based on the work itself. And, for something you're describing as something very marginal or of, of, of interest to a, to a narrow group of people, uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, there is some degree to which people have to be able to find things on their own. It's, it, you know, there's, there's got to be a natural curiosity that people have for that, that thing. And there's only so many ways to make that happen from our institution's point of view. So I think you have to think beyond us to the community. You know, if you're talking about community, I think that's where you've got to go to those communities and figure out what the connection is. Um, we're, we're almost your last resort in those situations, unfortunately, I think. I have a funny feeling just based on the hands raised and the Twitter responses that I know it's going to be talked about at dinner and we could talk for another hour, but it is 6 o'clock. Um, and especially for the dance dramaturgy people, we need to get on the road. So thank you to Ann Catania, Peter Marks, and Linda Weiner. A lot to chew on. Um, very quick housekeeping things before we send you to dinner in the conference bar. If you lost sunglasses, see me. Um, if you are going to the Dance Dramaturgy Workshop, the one train to 18th Street, I will meet anyone who wants a guide uh, at the registration table in 15 minutes, and I'm happy to guide you all down there together. Um, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, if you could be at 9.30 tomorrow morning so we can start at 9.45, that would be awesome. See you at the bar.